can you talk about, let's just start with Nora. Uh, how was it jumping into that movie with her and Tom Hanks and uh, Meg Ryan? Yeah, that, um, I, I uh, you know, was, uh, I didn't, I turned it down first. Oh, yeah? That's a bad start to it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, with uh, Sleepless in Seattle, I just, there was something about it that I just felt like, I don't want to be that guy. Yeah. And then um, it was Meg Ryan who had, I didn't know from Adam. I didn't think anybody would care if I turned it down, really, because I hadn't really established myself that much. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just thought, you know, well, somebody else will want this part or something. And then Meg Ryan got back that she wanted to talk to me, and she said, no, I, you got to do this part. And I was so, you know, flattered and everything, but I said, why do I have to do this part? <laughs> and, uh, she said, because it's like Philadelphia story. Oh, it's okay. like Cary Grant and you're Jimmy Stewart. That's not bad. Yeah. Didn't really turn out to be that kind of triangle. <laughs> <laughs> Lesson, don't trust actors. <laughs> <laughs> they want what they want, and they'll say anything. Get it. She totally got it. Seduce you with the yeah, Jimmy Stewart line. Jimmy yeah. Stewart. And then the next thing you know, you're on the, you know, Nor Ephron going, now that when you're blowing the nose with your allergies, there's just a lot of handkerchiefs all over you. I don't think Jimmy Stewart would have done this <laughs> stupid looking stuff. But no, I was glad I did it. And I was really glad to you know, be part of that one. Had you actually, and I'm just thinking, I mean, you were saying I didn't want to be that guy. Had you played that guy really? Uh, very often, like I, that's well, why your career is interesting. That you seem to play these parts where people go, like you said, with ruthless to to spaceball. Somebody goes, that I want to see that, and that's something else. But so I didn't really see you as that guy. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I think you know, I was just I moved up in a kind of a fairly or, or you know, un exceptional way, and you know, you get small parts, or then you say get like the second male lead or yeah, something. Yeah. And those were good parts, so that you would say in a traditional way, you know, like Slipper says, yeah, well, Walter's like the second male lead. Yeah, but, you know, yeah. he's the guy that doesn't get the girl, you know? And that was so iconic. There was a period where th that actually was a thing that critics would say, oh, Bill Pullman, he's playing guys that don't get the girl. Yeah. Somebody put it together. And I thought, oh, I did. Summersby, Malice, and, uh, and while, while You're Sleeping. Yeah, yeah. Or um, Sleepless in Seattle. Yeah, yeah. And those were guys that didn't get the girl. You know, a Southern, a Summersby, the summer, you know, a, a guy in the South who's where, you know, I had my sleeves up here. Yeah. I looked like the you know, puritanical berserko, you know. Yeah. He didn't get the girl. Surprise. Mm -hmm. you know. Three very different movies where you're not getting the girl. That's Three very diversity. different yeah. movies and everything, yeah. So, um, but you know, people just want to get a handle on you, and, and I was desperate not to get, have anybody get a handle on me. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting, I, I think, if I could sum up the diversity angle that I've been talking about this last bit, your last two movies that I've watched in the last couple of weeks could not be more different. I look at you in Battle of the Sexes, and uh, I want to look at Jack Kramer. Jack Kramer. He was, he, I'm just thinking now, he was the head of the Tennis Federation, I'm trying to think. Yeah, yeah. Talk about, if you wouldn't mind, and then we'll talk about your Western second, but two very different roles. But, um, what drew you to his character? Because he struck me as the guy that was in the middle between Riggs and almost like Billie Jean's husband. And has everybody seen Battle of the Sexes? Has anybody seen it at all? Beautiful, yeah. Really captured well. What drew you to a character like that? Because he seemed to be the middle guy, the guy that had a conscience of what was coming in terms of the movement, but still had to be the old boys club. Is that my own? Well, you're very generous, Jim, to, to that, because you know, there is a way he's set up as the bad guy, like yeah. the blocking character, the male chauvinist pig. And I said, oh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I just kind of, I, uh, there's another one. I got a list of ones that I've turned down and then really? did. Yeah, yeah. And I uh, must ask my psychiatrist about that. <laughs> but. Um, I, uh, Jonathan Dayton and Valerie Ferris, two excellent directors, and they, <clears throat> uh, they passed it on to me, and I said, I, I passed it on back that I, I, w I was gonna pass on the role. And they said, no, we wanna talk to you. And so I, oh, here we go, you know, this is it. 
the moment I've faced so many times before and never won. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I said, you know, I just don't think you need me to do that guy. Uh, there's somebody else's, you know, it's, it was the original script particularly was, um, you know, it, to me it felt like you're playing the guy who's the, you know, um, the high school principal in a, in a teen movie about fun renegades in high school and they yeah. need a creepy big guy that is going to try to impose order and discipline on them and and then at the end he gets a pie in his face yeah. and the audience goes, yay! Hey! We never yeah. liked that guy anyway. And uh, and I just thought, I, I don't know, it's like fodder and, and you know, they're such thoughtful filmmakers mm -hmm. and um, they said, that's why we want you, is that you're not going to do that to that guy, you know. And so we worked on the script with uh, uh, Simon Beaufoy, who's the British guy who wrote the full Monty and everything. And mm -hmm. so he's the established guy, and I didn't know how well he'd take to my ideas. <laughs> you know, but uh, you go into those meetings, hoping for the best. Yeah, and yeah. he was very, very understand. You know, he was interested, and we, we crafted it as much as we could to, to try to get some dimension of him so you don't just sell him down the river. Yeah. And I think that's the value of the whole movie. I I really think it's a it's a humanist humanist story. It's kind of an exceptional movie, I think, in mm -hmm. some ways, because um, it's not like a rah rah sports movie where you're meant. You know, it's really everybody has some ugly sides to or some un, human sides, so foibles. It's at that level, you know. Right. And I love every every everybody in that ensemble is really. Um, um, really fantastic, and uh, I think uh, Emma is such a nuanced person. Andrea Riesboro, Riesboro, she's fabulous. She's, Boy, uh, that, chameleon. Oof, and yeah. you know their relationship is so effervescent and so fraught with complications. And the guy that plays her husband, you know, is so really good. Uh, it, was, it was exceptional. And so I was glad I was part of the movie, even though you still see those reviews. Or somebody, I don't really read reviews, but somebody jammed one and says, oh, he's the guy you hate, you know. <laughs> there we go, I didn't, I didn't. I, listen, I don't say this because you're sitting here watching the film, and this is Bobby Riggs versus Billie Jean King. I mean, this was, my folks made me stay up. I was nine, said, you have to see this. And it was like on at eight o'clock. It was a big deal back then, but I can see hiring you because it would have been easy to have this guy, as you said, be a one-dimensional, you know, villain with the top hat and tying the woman to the railway tracks, and you needed to have humanity in this character, as I thought. Yeah. You know, he had to. You had to have some. He had to be appealing in some way. Yeah. He's, yeah. He's, he sees the changes coming, but he's trying to balance it. I, I and just, there's a lot of evidence in that he was that guy. We were talking backstage about our our mutual love of westerns. I love westerns. They they have stayed the same in so many aspects since the early 1900s, and you have taken on one. It's why you're up here, one of the reasons you're up here. Uh, and we also have the writer-director here. Tonight. I'm very yes. excited that we have him and we're gonna bring him up because Jared Marche, who wrote and directed the Ballad of Lefty Brown, allowed me last night to stay, uh, stand on the set and say to Christian Bale, my Western against your Western. Because <laughs> 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 yeah. he's in Hostiles, I don't know, but that's a big budget movie, you know, big budget Western and everything else. But I got to say it because of Jared. Very nice, we're gonna bring he him up. Uh, he's sitting movie. right here. Uh, Jared, what, come on up for a sec, Jared. We'll talk about this. I'm gonna stand so Did that- Did really say that? Yeah, I said. I said I got a better writer and director than you do, too. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> no. uh, Bill, you play uh, Lefty. This is, I said to you guys backstage, as a lover of, of, of Westerns, this is like the sidekick finally getting his movie. This is Walter Brennan with no Gary Cooper or John Wayne or anything. Can you guys tell our audience who haven't seen the movie, uh, tell us about the movie and the character. You go, because I've been talking. <laughs> nice. You have some water right there. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> It's a, it's a story of a sidekick. Uh, I like to call it a coming-of-age story for a 63-year-old sidekick. Um, <laughs> but it, it's a Western about uh, Lefty Brown, who is sort of the quintessential Western sidekick uh, to a character played by Peter Fonda called Edward Johnson. And um, suddenly, on, uh, out of the blue, Johnson is killed by a bunch of cattle rustlers. And Lefty, this man who's never made a decision, in his entire life, now has to go and track down the killer. 
<laughs> and uh, really has to grow up in the process, I think. And one of the things we talked about that I love about Westerns when they're shot right, and you, you captured it, is, is just the landscape can be a benefit and a star, one of the stars of the, the show. And you shot this in Montana. There was no way you were going to shoot this on a back lot or, you know. No, but they did want us to shoot it in Canada. Okay, that's, I would have liked that more, but uh, Montana's okay, because uh, Bill, you, you have a home there, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this was, they were more of an attraction as well to do this film. Well, you yeah. know, Calgary it gets a lot of Westerns, and yeah. I think, in, you know, they always like to throw a few crumbs to Montana every once in a while, <laughs> and because it just doesn't have the, you know, Calgary's an incredible place to shoot Westerns. They've got all those great Wranglers there. They've got every kind of scenery in 360 degrees direction within mm -hmm. an hour and everything else, and Montana doesn't have that. It doesn't have a pool of talent, of crews and everything. So Jared, there's a lot of pressure probably. To, a little bit. To, you know, this, the, to do it there, but he fell in love with uh, the first territorial capital, really. Yeah, Bannock, was, this town. Uh, I, I feel like there's so many Westerns, like I watch them and I'm like, oh yeah, that is the Bonanza Creek Ranch, or that is, you know, the, the Hell on Wheels town. You just recognize the worlds. And... Um, in Montana, there's this town called Bannock, which is the first territorial capital of Montana. It is a historic ghost town. Nothing has ever been filmed that before until we went in there. Um, and I showed up there in December. It was covered in snow, and it looked nothing like it does in the movie. Uh, but I just like fell in love with it because it was this town in the middle of nowhere where you could put a camera and get you know wilderness in any direction, and it felt like the West writ large. And let's give a big thumbs up. We all love Kathy Baker who just deserves more awards. She's made for a Western, too. Yeah, this is her first Western. Yeah. Kathy Baker uh, is such an incredible actress. And um, she was, when she, uh, when I actually first talked with her about the role, she was very clear. She's like, this is the only woman in this movie. Yeah. And she was like, why? Because <laughs> she does, she's going to put you through your paces. Yeah. And I uh, had to explain to her that um, her character was in a lot of ways based on this woman, Marianne Goodnight, who was the wife of Charles Goodnight, who is the character who John Wayne in Red River is based on. Oh. Um, and uh, she, while they were still married, uh, Marianne lived on a ranch in the middle of nowhere of Texas, had one, had one best friend who was a woman, saw her once a year, um, and otherwise lived in this world completely surrounded by men. And when Goodnight died uh, relatively young, she stayed there and ran the ranch. And, um, you know, this was her life, being this sort of woman, this female figure in a very male world. And then Kathy, after that conversation, Kathy understood and actually did some research. And I think it really helped with her performance And she, as she brought some of Marianne into it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Jared, we'll see you. You'll be there tonight, obviously, too, right? Yeah. yeah. Thank good, you. good, good, good. Well... This is good, uh, I, but I am kind of, we, you talked about having some questions and answers, yeah. and uh, since we're free form, when you ever see a tribute reel that starts with Schwartz's, <laughs> we can do whatever we want. Agreed, agreed. Yes. 